as an economist, I am a disciple of Keynes, educated in Cambridge, as you just heard. I was a friend of Minsky, and I'm the son of a fellow who made his literary reputation by publishing a small book uh, 54 years ago that was entitled The Great Crash. As such, I was temperamentally unsurprised by the crisis, and that has set me apart quite substantially from the overwhelming majority of the modern academic economics profession, uh, for whom these events had been rendered by uh, the improvement of monetary policy, uh, the more perfect functioning of models of markets, and the uh, effectiveness of new techniques of quantitative risk management substantially impossible. And therefore, not only they couldn't happen, but surely they didn't happen. The fact that they did happen has provided me with an entirely unexpected uh, increase in my degree of respectability. <laughs> On August 15th, 1971, when Richard Nixon stunned the world by introducing wage and price controls, uh, my father, who had administered those controls in the Second World War, was called up by the Washington Post for a comment. And he said, I feel like the uh, streetwalker who has just been told that not only is her profession legal, but the highest form of municipal service. <laughs> and of course, I feel very much the same way in the wake of the events that have occurred over the last couple of years. The mission of task, as Paula described it a few minutes ago, is to call attention to economic and social questions related especially to inequality. And this, as it happens, has been for 15 years or so, my primary field of academic research. And while the conventional economics largely treats inequality as a matter of supply and demand, supply of skill and demand for it owing to technology and trade and other factors settled in labor markets and therefore totally separate as a domain of inquiry from macroeconomics and finance. My work persuaded me long ago that the two issues are so, in fact, so closely connected, so deeply intertwined, as to be practically speaking the same topic. Inequality is not, in fact, a static social condition, primarily. It is rather a process, which is driven by the rise of new technologies and the great fortunes that are associated with uh, them. Uh, and those are, in turn, associated with the work of the capital markets and of the banking system. The rise and occasional declines, but for most of the last generation, very substantial increases in income inequality in the United States, which can be tracked on a month to month and certainly a year to year basis uh, in official data, follows the movement of the stock market and especially of the NASDAQ with extraordinary precision going back perhaps 40 years. And what you can take away from this is that a dramatic increase in inequality, such as we experienced in the United States and you experienced here, <clears throat> 
is practically speaking an indicator of an unstable and speculative phenomenon. A period of prosperity, to be sure, but one that is destined to end badly, as in fact J.A. Hobson already knew nearly a century ago. That said, the current crisis has special characteristics, a question of depth, of scale, and of the global reach of the events that make it truly uh, distinctive. You might say that it is a matter of inequality driven by financial speculation meeting up with globalization under the neoliberal order, uh, a marriage made in hell. The origins of the crisis, as the world knows, lie in the United States residential uh, mortgage market and especially in the securitization of subprime and also what are known as Alt-A uh, mortgage loans that came to uh, dominate the process of mortgage originations uh, in the middle part of the past decade. The spread of the crisis uh, from the US to the rest of the world has a number of vectors, but the primary one and perhaps the most important was the distribution of the securities based on those loans uh, through the world banking system and the emulation of American banking practices that went along with it. This point and the appreciation of the dynamics of bubbles is, I think, been talked about a great deal. But there is something about this process which has not been sufficiently stressed, in my view, in the way in which uh, we have uh, gotten used to discussing it. Uh, something which goes far beyond the mechanics of, uh, of bubbles. And that is that at the deepest level, the entire sector was thoroughly infested with financial fraud. Uh, there was fraud in the origination uh, and the documentation of the mortgages that underlay the securities. That is to say, on a very systematic basis, the loans were made to people who could not or would not document their incomes, uh, whose credit histories were doubtful or bad, uh, and collateralized by houses uh, which were systematically over appraised by appraisers who were selected on the basis of their malleability and willingness to do that, so as to maximize the value of the loan and therefore of the fees associated with the origination by lenders who knew uh, that the loans would stand a very low chance of being serviced through their lifetimes because they knew uh, that the burden of the mortgages would rise rapidly after just a few years. This fraud was abetted uh, by the banks that underwrote the packages of loans, pretending that by grouping them together you could eliminate this form of risk, and by the ratings agencies which allowed certain practices to yield uh, tranches of these uh, securities which could be rated AAA and therefore bought uh, by uh, uh, investors who were in a fiduciary position. The fraud was abetted by the public authorities uh, in the United States, uh, a mechanism which I have called in my book a manifestation of the predator state. That is to say, public authorities who sent very clear signals to the banking sector that previous standards for underwriting and enforcement of banking practices would not be enforced. How were those signals sent? This was not done in a subtle or underhanded way. On one occasion, the first director of the Office of Thrift Supervision in the George W. Bush administration came to a press conference with a stack of copies of the Code of Federal Regulations and a chainsaw. A chainsaw. As I say, subtlety was not the point here. You were talking to bankers and you wanted to get the point across, and they did. The administration also received clear warnings as far back as 2004 from the Federal Bureau of Investigation that we were facing an epidemic of mortgage fraud. That's the FBI's term. 
and they ignored those warnings. Resources were not provided. Directions were not given to assemble the kind of prosecutorial task forces that would have been required uh, to take these practices down in time. And there was an entire language in the industry that signals the consciousness of what was going on. These loans were called no-doc loans, liar's loans, neutron loans, loans which uh, would leave the, destroy the people but leave the buildings intact. Right? Explosive loans, toxic waste. The clear consciousness that the originators and purveyors knew what they were doing. And I stress this point because I want to talk about the slump and the response to it because an appreciation of this fact seems to me at completely critical to understanding what has been deficient about the response so far. It was, of course, and has been a, a slump of extraordinary violence comparable on the global scale only to the collapse of the early 1930s, a collapse of world trade that's on the order, I believe, of about a third, uh, a uh, collapse in durable goods sales of 40 or 50 percent, a collapse in housing prices of over half. In the United States, a collapse in employment that has gone on at 600,000 jobs a month for six months running and is still going on. The response has proceeded in three phases, and I'll talk about each of them um, briefly. The first was a phase of panic, unpreparedness, uh, and uh, improvisation on, on the part of the uh, Treasury and the Federal Reserve uh, in the last part of the last year in the last months of the Bush administration. Uh, the Treasury initially, of course, asked for $700 billion of unsupervised funds for the purpose of buying back the uh, bad assets from the banking system, a process that an observer I knew uh, uh, compared to attempting to fill the Pacific Ocean with basketballs. Uh, I have to say that between the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, uh, in the face of um, a really emerging panic in the financial system, which was quite apparent to close observers in late September, early October, uh, the totally impractical and unimplementable proposal, initial proposal, yielded to something that was substantially more practical and more effective, namely taking the uh, old New Deal stalwart of deposit insurance and extending it to a quarter of a million dollars, nationalizing the commercial paper market so that businesses could get access uh, to their basic liquidity needs, and then a more or less symbolic gesture of buying preferred shares in the banks rather than uh, attempting to shore up the non-existent and collapsed asset, uh, markets for their assets. Uh, so there was an effort to prevent the system from completely imploding in a way which would have made the uh, um, slump even more catastrophic and underpinned the institutional basis for a restoration, and that had an element of success to it. The second phase in the response was one uh, that reflected, in the first instance, the power of uh, the institutions of a Keynesian macroeconomy, uh, and also the resilience of uh, the underlying uh, Keynesian idea of fiscal stabilization, at least in the United States. Uh, the scale of the operation of automatic stabilizers, that is to say the fall off in tax revenues and the increase in public spending that simply comes from unemployment insurance, food stamps, and other forms of relief, uh, has been quite dramatic, leaving us with um, budget deficits that are on the order of 10 or 12 percent of GDP are projected to be. Uh, and that of course, is dollar for dollar an increase in the savings and improvement in the financial position of the household and business sectors. And as to say, the public de deficit, deficit, public sector's deficit is uh, exactly matched by a surplus in the private sector. People talk about shoots of green. Those shoots of green are almost entirely 
the result of the massive change in the fiscal position of the US government. So it's somewhat disingenuous for those same people to lament the scale of the budget deficit because it is the budget deficit that gives you the shoots of green, those are greenbacks uh, that are actually seeing coming out of the ground. Uh, and um, <clears throat> that is independent of any discretionary decisions by the state, that is to say, of government policy. In addition to that, uh, Congress, which mouths fiscal platitudes, platitudes of fiscal rectitude uh, on uh, all, most Sundays, I should say, uh, when it got down to business in the crisis, uh, had only one objective in January, and that was to uh, produce as big a stimulus bill as could reasonably be passed in three weeks, and that was done. That is to say, a Keynesian policy of macroeconomic expansion. And it's extremely important to note that that was, in fact, uh, basically a consensus opinion, opinion, uh, position. It carried the Congress quite dramatically, uh, and it will have a substantial effect going forward, even though I argued at the time and still believe uh, that the scale of the program was limited by technical and ideological and political factors, uh, which made it much smaller uh, than you would have put in place if you were designing a program strictly on economic grounds. Nevertheless, the third phase uh, is the plan with respect to the banks, what we call the Geithner uh, plan, um, what I call the Geithner plan, uh, possibly because I want someone I can blame it on, um, and, uh, possibly because I wanted to entitle an article Critique of the Geithner Program, which I thought had a nice ring to it. But, uh, uh, the editor of the magazine that published the article didn't recognize the illusion, so it didn't get printed. Um, which is, has taken up an enormous amount of the new administration's political energy and bureaucratic ingenuity. Uh, and I think, in general, to a very poor effect. The Geithner plan is, practically speaking, a scheme uh, which would, if it is successful in its implementation, transfer the bad assets uh, of the banking system into what are called public-private investment partnerships, uh, heavily financed by non-recourse loans uh, from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and hold them there on two thoughts. First of all, the idea that the banks, once freed of this supposed incubus of non-performing assets uh, will return to the market for loans and help fuel a new economic expansion. And secondly, that the assets themselves, uh, if held out of, com out of hors de combat, out of the fray for a certain period of time, will eventually recover value and then be able to be reintegrated back into a functioning uh, capital market. Um, and I think both are extremely doubtful propositions. The first being doubtful because it is unreasonable to expect banks to resume lending in the absence of borrowers who wish to resume borrowing and who can justify doing so with adequate projects and adequate collateral. And the collapse of asset values has simply removed the American household sector for the time being uh, from being in a position to resume borrowing on the scale that drove the economy forward in the last uh, part of the last decade, or in fact, over the last 25 years. And that's, I think, going to be a very long-term problem which cannot be solved simply by recapitalizing the banks or stuffing them with cash. And secondly, and more seriously, to come back to the point I was just making, the failure to recognize that the problem of the, un, of the bad assets is not simply a problem of confidence or a problem of crisis, but a problem of fraud is a, entails a belief that those assets can in fact form the basis of a functioning market when I think that belief is thoroughly unfounded. They only came into the market in the first place because people were prepared to rely on the ratings agencies to, uh, for, the, for the quality of the assets. And the ratings agencies are now known to have been essentially behaving in a way which I think a reputable, a reputable criminologist, whom I 
that respect greatly has characterized as fraudulent, that is to say, pretending uh, to be able to assess uh, the quality of those assets with proprietary models that were not uh, capable of performing that function. And the result of that, if I'm correct, is that the markets will simply not recover except on the basis of uh, essentially insider trading, banks buying the assets in order to prop up the prices in order to maintain the valuation of the assets that they keep on their own books in order to perpetrate and perpetuate the essentially uh, fraudulent and false uh, valuation of the bank's own assets and therefore to continue to conceal the fundamental problem of the banking system, which is the collapse of the value of the assets uh, that it holds. And that is going to lead to deep problems uh, with the banking system going forward, competitive problems, problems of continued uh, risk and instability, as well as problems for the public sector credibility and perhaps for its public finances uh, when the loans that have been made uh, to the public-private partnerships default uh, and the assets themselves revert to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the losses are recorded on the books of the state. What's the balance of effects here? I think, and to be perfectly fair and honest, that there are positive results, both from the instinctive and reflexive institutional reactions to the slump um, and from uh, the positive policy decisions that were taken early uh, this year. Fiscal stabilization, that is to say the traditional Keynesian policy of running a big budget deficit in the face of a big economic collapse, does work. It does have exactly the effects that it is supposed to have. And in combination with the inventory liquidation, which is already going on, you'll see a certain stabilization of activity, increased savings, improved confidence, and a probable floor to production. And some of this will have implications in the industrial system. As Chrysler emerges from bankruptcy, it may find that there is some pent up demand for cars and who knows, it's possible that the General Motors reorganization could also be moderately successful in the same sense, whereas it would not have been if the industry had been allowed to collapse last December. All of this is of course reflected in the financial markets which have gone up by 30 or 40% already. But from the standpoint of the larger population, this does not amount to economic recovery and will not even resemble economic recovery at all. The level of employment and unemployment is a far more important economic statistic than the growth rate of GDP or the valuation of the stock market. And the fact is that the level of, of unemployment will continue to rise, the level of employment will continue to fall. And even after employment stabilizes, the unemployment rate will stay up for quite a long time because even as a few jobs become available, many people who have abandoned the search for jobs will come back in and be recorded as unemployed, whereas they are not now. And so we are looking at a period which can only be regarded as one of profound disappointment and ultimately perhaps policy and political failure unless further steps are taken, truly much more aggressive and effective steps to deal with uh, the, uh, the unemployment problem. And these are being compounded now by the crisis in states and localities, the fiscal crisis, the uh, uh, the fact that the housing sector is simply not coming back and the uncertain future of the banking sector even in a climate of economic recovery. This of course is also a global crisis and the global crisis means that the problems of a global financial misgovernance are going to get in the way of the effective response uh, at the global scale. Um, Maria has already talked, I think, quite effectively about some of the issues involved in responding to the crisis at the European uh, level, including uh, the absence of a um, <coughs> uh, liquid, fully liquid uh, euro bond market, including uh, particularly the difference of opinion and the need for consensus and the absolute failure to get it 
uh, for uh, a, a, fis a discretionary fiscal expansion uh, similar to what has happened in the United States, uh, including, I have to say, the lack of solidarity that evidently exists across Europe of the comfortable and less affected countries for those that are more deeply affected, uh, and uh, including also the limitations on the freedom of action of the central bank that are incumbent uh, to the ECB charter. So it might not be unfair to say that uh, when comparing the two continents, that Europe is better buffered because it has a larger public sector and a stronger welfare state, uh, but less responsive than the United States. And that our problem is administrative and legislative. Decisions taken can be implemented if you can get them taken. Whereas the dis problem here has a constitutional aspect, which makes it substantially more uh, difficult to resolve. And of course, the consequences are felt most severely uh, in what one may call the peripheral countries, on the countries on the uh, periphery of uh, the uh, major European industrial powers, uh, Spain, of course, Ireland, Greece, and the Eastern accession countries, uh, where the effects are especially dramatic. The unemployment rate is uh, at a level that uh, um, is truly uh, shocking uh, and where there is uh, no reason to believe uh, that there are mechanisms in place that would bring back, bring an early uh, reestablishment of the situation. And I, Maria has also said, and I can only say that I also share her, her, her fears uh, that this may have consequences uh, for the legitimacy of the European Union uh, and the uh, process of European integration going forward. Could the United States pull the world out? It's obvious that any one country that grows will have positive effects on all the others. But I still think that there are dangers, some of them imponderable, that lie ahead. Uh, and just to mention them because we should be aware of them uh, going forward. The first, of course, is in the financial sector. We do not know how long it will take for American households to pay down or default on their debts and restore their financial position, for them to overcome their current strong liquidity preference, for banks to overcome their aversion to newly acquired for aversion to, to risk, and to work around the extremely poor state of collateral. So the fate of the credit mechanism as an engine for future recovery is very, very much in doubt. And that is true in the United States and is true around the world. Secondly, there is the fact of globalization in production and trade, which means that as capital is destroyed in the slump, with, for example, the reduction in capacity in the automobile sector, demand in, when it recovers will increasingly and disproportionately come be directed overseas, and that will not be to Europe. It will be primarily to places like Korea, to Japan, to China, uh, which have the capacity and the ability to ramp up their production uh, to, su to supply these goods at highly competitive prices. And while that, of course, does mean, I think, that the Chinese may benefit from uh, the stabilization of American demand, uh, that is a channel which probably does not spill over to an enormous degree elsewhere in the world. Perhaps even more threatening uh, is the risk that we run uh, that if and as there is an improvement and stabilization in demand, that it will be taken advantage of by those who are in a position to influence or control the supply and price of crucial commodities, and especially oil, uh, and that we could see, in fact, we are already seeing to some degree, have already seen practically a doubling in the price of oil from the bottom, a run-up in the prices of sensitive commodities, uh, which would then be reflected as an inflationary pressure in domestic markets and provoke an adverse response from policymakers. And I think this is a danger which reflects very poorly on the existing state of policy because it can only be met by a truly aggressive and effective campaign to deal with the, um, our dependence on uh, very unstable sources of energy supply, uh, and we are not making the efforts that we need to be making in that area. 
And then finally, I worry about the problem of uh, premature declaration of victory. Uh, there is, in every political community, an enormous desire to get back to talking about the familiar issues. And you can already feel the specialist communities are pushing their way to the front of the agenda. Uh, some of these things that they're talking about are very useful and important things to do, but not necessarily directly relevant to the financial crisis. And then there are others who are obsessed with financial constructs like budget deficits and debt ratios, about which they, in fact, know very little, uh, who use those numbers uh, to frighten the public uh, into a belief that we cannot afford basic social security, social insurance payments, uh, welfare systems uh, that are protecting people, in fact, the only thing standing between large parts of the population and destitution. And that being the case, if those agendas come to prevail, come to dominate, and they have very, very powerful constituencies, well-connected and well-influential uh, in the press, we could end up with a kind of policy reversal that means that uh, whatever forces have been leading to stabilization and expansion get reversed, uh, say, in a year or two. And I worry about that a great deal. What should have been done and what perhaps could still be done? In the first place, the banks should have been taken care of uh, by policymakers who were operating, operating independently and autonomously and not primarily with concern for the institutions of the banks themselves. That is to say, in the way that the law prescribes in the United States, that is to, uh, for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to take banks into conservatorship, it's called pass-through receivership, to install their own managers, to get a clean audit, to guarantee the deposits, operate the banks, and prepare them for a resolution which may be a closing, a merger, sale, breakup, as appropriate to the institutional conditions. That's something that cannot be done in collaboration or negotiation with an existing management that's mainly concerned with preserving its own position. And as a result, the compromise on that point fundamentally compromises the uh, approach to the financial sector going forward. In my view, the most effective way we have of buffering the population, that any nation has of buffering the population, is the existing social insurance schemes. In our case, social security. And the easiest way to, to deal with the, let's say, the problem of the elderly population, which has lost its house value, its stock market value, and the interest on its cash holdings been wiped out, essentially, in its private wealth and income position, is to increase social insurance payments, a very simple step that would reach everybody in a very short period of time. Reducing the payroll taxes that are part of the fiction of pension fund financing would provide equivalent and comparable relief where it was most needed to working families uh, and enable them to continue to meet mortgages and car payments as well as to eventually uh, expand their consumption. The dramatic steps to stop the wave of foreclosures, which is not only driving people in living standards down, forcing them into rental units, but in many cases creating homelessness, tent cities actually springing up uh, in, say, Sacramento, California and other places in recent months. Uh, and uh, while you don't necessarily want to keep people in untenable positions, it's very, very good idea to keep the houses occupied as much as possible to prevent the assets themselves from being wrecked and burnt and otherwise destroyed. And there should have been measures to protect state and local governments and to prevent what is now a second wave crisis clearly developing as states like California uh, are forced to the wall and come out with ideas like cutting a million poor children off of health care, something that's happening. I mentioned energy policy and it's clear to me that moving forward this is a sector which provides the capacity in a country like ours for, a, for developing a new economy that can last us for a generation, attempting to improve our efficiency of both production and consumption, reordering our way of life, major investments required that could keep many people employed and leave us possibly in a position to provide not only technological but moral leadership uh, on the climate crisis, something which we are not now doing and which if we do not begin to do very soon, we will clearly compromise the entire future viability of the planet. And then finally, something a bit more abstract and um, perhaps ethereal, 
but it seems to me that it would be useful to consider what measures might renew confidence uh, in the role that the United States has been playing as the um, country at the center of the world currency and financial system and the supplier of the reserve asset. You know, over the 50 years, of, well, at least anyway, the first 40 years after the end of the Second World War, there was a justification for the U.S. holding that position because of its place in the security system. And it's obviously clear that the attempt to replace that justification with a return to the Middle Ages and religious warfare uh, was not persuasive to the rest of the world and uh, is not going to provide a sound basis for the American position going forward, as the President Obama in Cairo today clearly is aware. So exactly what is that justification if there's going to be one? And I, being a conservative fellow and one who likes the American position, I'm inclined to say we should try. And it's clear to me that providing some initiative, some clear initiatives in the energy and climate area is perhaps the only promising possibility uh, going forward, something that would actually be useful uh, for the rest of the world and give them some reason to want to finance it. Let me conclude very briefly. As I said, the record of the country's institutions and of the Obama administration so far is one of fairly effective stabilizing intervention. The institutions haven't collapsed, and some of the Keynesian mechanisms that we've relied on in the past are at work today. But I fear that this policy is being implemented with what is essentially an unattainable intermediate objective, that of restoring the previous model of economic growth, the status quo ante of a bank-led, credit-driven economic expansion, taking whatever direction the leaders of the financial institution, whose judgment, by the way, has not been demonstrated to be either particularly sound or closely aligned with the public interest. I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but uh, 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 so there's a contradiction. It's not to say that the policy will not work in some very narrow short-term sense, but it is likely not to be sustainable and not to have achieved the fundamental reforms that we would require in order to give us 20 or 30 years of directed, sustainable, and um, quality of life enhancing growth, which we require. I think that contradiction will become clear, and perhaps sooner rather than later, as some of the problems that I've already described uh, manifest themselves. And then we will be faced with a choice. Will we dissolve as a country and as a global community into a cacophony of uh, snake oil solutions and uh, demagogic appeals with perhaps no coherent policy outcome? Or will we be able to make a coherent and effective argument that's directed along lines which I think have been made once again respectable by the crisis, that is to say the lines of thinking that were pioneered by Keynes, by Minsky, by my father, um, and develop an effective and efficient policy. Um, Churchill made a remark once that uh, you can always count on America to do the right thing after it has exhausted all of the alternatives. And so I just hope that that remains, uh, uh, that remark still has an element of truth. Thank you very much. <laughs>